This plane is often called a flying gun. Moving inside the cockpit, the pilot aligns the symbology with the computer-assisted targeting system. When everything is ready, they squeeze the trigger capable of pumping out 3,900 rounds per minute. The weapon is built around a rugged frame and the pilot sits inside a titanium bathtub, providing protection during close support missions. It's fitted with turbofan engines that draw in air from the front, compress it, and convert it into energy, thus producing thrust. These engines consume around 11,000 gallons of fuel, which is pumped from four separate compartments tanks. We'll also go through the step-by-step -step process of dropping gravity bombs and the physics behind it. Plus, we'll cover the cold start procedure for starting a jet, just in case you ever find yourself in this aircraft. More details, all in the video ahead. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt, an aircraft we have meticulously modeled inside and out to help you better understand its design and capabilities. The A-10 is a ground attack aircraft primarily constructed from aluminum alloys. Its airframe consists of multiple independent beams that run along the length of the fuselage and wings, providing exceptional structural integrity. Since these aircraft operate at very low altitudes to support ground troops, they often face intense enemy fire. To withstand such conditions, the A-10 is designed with a rugged airframe capable of absorbing significant battle damage. It features extensive armor protection around the cockpit and the glass is also bulletproof and other critical components, making it exceptionally durable for close air support missions. In fact, the A-10's cockpit is encased in titanium armor, also called the bathtub, weighing approximately 1,200 pounds, which translates 540 kilograms, allowing it to withstand heavy impacts and continue flying even hostile environments. Let's start from the front. This aircraft, along with its entire frame, was built specifically to accommodate this massive gun. Because of that, the landing gear had to be pushed to the sides. To give you an idea of its scale, let's compare it to a person. You can see just how huge it is. From this top angle, you'll notice that the gun is slightly off-center. This is named as the Gao 8 Avenger, a 30mm cannon, and it's actually angled downward by a few degrees. The Gao 8 Avenger uses a 7-barrel gabbling design where barrels rotate around a central axis. Each barrel fires sequentially, allowing rapid cooling between shots and reducing wear. The rotation is powered by dual hydraulic motors producing 77 horsepower, which spin the barrels at high speeds, achieving a rate of fire of 3,900 rounds per minute down from an initial 4,200 revolutions per minute to extend barrel life. It also employs a double-ended, linkless feed system that cycles spent casings back into the drum magazine instead of ejecting them. This prevents imbalances in the aircraft's center of gravity and avoids debris ingestion by engines. The drum holds up to 1,174 rounds typically loaded with 1,150 and requires a specialized reloading, a process that can take hours due to the system's complexity. The gun generates 10,045 kilonewton of recoil more than one of the A-10's TF-34 engines which produces 9,065 pounds each. To counteract this, the gun is mounted off-center slightly to the port side. This design balances recoil forces preventing pitch or yaw deviations during firing. The reason for the high recoil is because of the size of these rounds. For reference, this is a standard bullet. Right next to it is a 50 caliber round. Finally, this is the massive 30 mm bullet used in the Gao 8 Avenger. To put things into perspective, let's compare it to the size of a human hand, and it is enormous. To help you understand better, this is a cross-section of an armor-piercing incendiary round made with a depleted uranium penetrator. Just below that is the jacket, followed by a tracer round, pellant charge, and finally the electric primer. When fired, it can pass through 38 millimeters of steel when fired from a range of 1,000 meters. Moving back to the front, the two objects positioned just above the gun and the forward radar warning receiver. To create a 360-degree protection, these are also fitted on the wings on each side and finally on the tip of the tail. They are essential for a ground attack jet as heat-seeking missiles always pose a potential threat. When a target is locked by radar and illuminated by a continuous wave or pulse Doppler signal, used for missiles with a semi-active radar seeker, these radar warning receivers pick it up. The HUD and display unit alert the pilot and activate countermeasures such as flares to confuse incoming missiles, helping to prevent a fatal crash. Even for civilians, there are countless bad actors targeting our computers, 
which is why we need a defense mechanism. Just like the A-10 Thunderbolt's multi-targeting radar. Similarly, this VPN identifies and blocks suspicious email with a harmful download link. In this case, it will alert you immediately. Now take a look at my Netflix account. As you can see, I'm currently in Norway. To switch to a US server, all I have to do is click here, refresh, and boom, you're now accessing Netflix US. Beyond that, it includes a robust antivirus software to shield your devices from viruses, malware, and tracking by ads, bots, or third parties. Finally, with Surfshark VPN, a single subscription covers not just you, but also your friends or even your entire city if you wanted. Go to our link surfshark.com slash AI telly. By buying through the promo link, you will get four extra months free assured by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Step over here. If you open this hatch, you'll find a ladder, which makes this one of the few military jets with a built-in way to climb straight into the cockpit. Once inside, you'll notice everything's we clearly labeled with most of its parts, so feel free to take your time exploring before we dive into learning how to fire the GAU-8 Avenger cannon. Right in front of you are the center stick controls. The red button on top is the weapon release, and just below that, you'll find the trigger for the gun. To use the GAU-8, first flip the red gun safety switch to gun pack ARM. This activates both the cannon and the precision attack control system. Once you've locked onto a target, line up the upper dot of the reticle and hold down the first stage trigger on the target as shown here. When you're within a mile of the target, pull the trigger all the way. This unleashes a barrage of rounds powerful enough to take out tanks or lightly armored vehicles. Now that you've got the hang of the gun, let's talk about dropping bombs in case you come across one of these. For a bombing run, the pilot arcs into a semi-circular dive toward the target but releases the bomb halfway through the maneuver. Thanks to physics, the bomb inherits the plane's forward speed at that moment, meaning it keeps flying ahead at the same velocity. With GPS guidance, it then glides precisely to its target. Inside the cockpit, let's take a look at the process of dropping gravity bombs. This is the velocity vector, it indicates the direction your aircraft is currently moving. Just below it is the computer-calculated impact point. The large line extending outward represents the projected weapon fall line. Here you can see the weapon selection symbology and just below it, the selected weapon. In this case, the Mark 82 bomb. Now the most important part to ensure accuracy, align the computer calculated impact point with the velocity vector of the aircraft, while also making sure the projected weapon straight line with the target. This is what the impact fall line would look like. Keep in mind that these Mark 82 bombs are often equipped with a GPS guidance kit for greater precision. When the targeting symbology aligns over the target, the pilot presses the top release button on the control stick. From that moment, physics, gravity, and the GPS bomb kit take over, guiding it toward its mark. Let's consider this scenario, supporting ground troops who are under heavy fire and pinned down by armored tanks and heavy artillery bombardment. It all begins with reconnaissance or troops that needed fire support, they scan the battlefield, pinpointing enemy positions and relaying vital intelligence with precise coordinates. Once the plan is in place, the A-10s take off and head toward the target area. Flying at low altitudes, they use terrain features for cover, avoiding enemy radar detection. Throughout the approach, they maintain constant communication with ground units, receiving real-time updates and adjusting their tactics as needed. As they close in, the A-10s unleash their iconic Gowie Avenger cannons, tearing through armored vehicles and artillery positions. But they need to change their strategy against heavily armored targets. They can use guided munitions or Hellfire missiles for moving targets, delivering devastating precision against enemy tanks. Smoke rises from the battlefield as the Thunderbolts rain down their firepower. But their mission doesn't end with the initial strike. The A-10s remain on station, providing critical close air support. As ground troops push forward, the pilots stay ready to respond instantly to enemy resistance and clear the path ahead. The A-10's engines are mounted high on the fuselage, a design choice that helps reduce the risk of damage from foreign objects when flying in partially damaged airports. This is how it works. The fan rotor draws in ambient air, which undergoes powerful compression in both the low-pressure and high-pressure compressors. Subsequently, the air enters the combustor, where fuel injection occurs. This process generates a continuous combustion of fuel and air, reaching temperatures about 1,000 degrees Celsius. The resultant heat causes the gas to expand, leading it to escape from the combustor with high energy, 
flowing through both the high and low pressure turbines. As a consequence, the turbine blades rotate. The energy liberated by this process drives both the compressor and the fan. Finally, the remaining exhaust gases exit through the nozzle, generating thrust. Unlike traditional jet engines, the TF-34G-100 produces relatively cooler and slower moving exhaust, reducing its heat signature and making the A-10 harder to detect with infrared sensors. All the power generated by the engine needs fuel, and they comes from these four compartmentalized self-sealing tanks. Here you'll find the forward fuel tank one and the rear fuel tank number two. Moving to the sides, you'll see two additional wing fuel tanks. Opening this lid reveals the single point refueling section. Through this refueling point, you can pump in up to 11,000 pounds of aircraft fuel. To put that into perspective, that's enough to fill about 20 school buses, assuming they use the same fuel type and each has an 80 gallon tank. These are the flaps on the A-10. When extended, they increase the wing's surface area and curvature, allowing the aircraft to maintain controlled flight during takeoff, landing, and slow speed maneuvers. Here are the slats. These help manage airflow over the wings, especially at high angles of attack, ensuring the aircraft remains stable and controllable even during sharp turns or aggressive maneuvers. The rudder mounted on the vertical stabilizer at the tail is the A-10's primary means of controlling yaw, the side-to-side -side movement of the aircraft's nose. Finally, the air brakes are one of the A-10's most distinctive features. These large panels extend from the fuselage just behind the wings, creating significant drag. They allow the A-10 to transition from high-speed flight to low-speed maneuvering without compromising stability, making them an indispensable tool for close air support missions. In case the military needs you, let's go over how to start this plane. First, set the inverter to standby, then turn on the battery power. Next, start the APU or auxiliary power unit. Wait for the APU gauge to reach 100%. Now start the left engine by setting the throttle to the idle position. Once the left engine is running smoothly, start the right engine. After both engines are up and running, turn off the APU. Finally, set all displays to either day or night mode depending on your needs. And just like that, full throttle and raising the control unit and you're ready to go. We make original videos from scratch, so please do subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos.